Thank you for having me here. I didn't have a chance to see much of Birmingham, but I saw enough of your university uh, to know it's quite an impressive edifice, and it's very well equipped. We have the ill fortune of probably having the only uh, equipment that doesn't work. <laughs> and that's the way life is. Um, I was asked to speak on a very specific topic this evening, namely how to resolve the conflict. Uh, if I had my choice in the matter, uh, I would prefer to speak about what's happening now in Gaza, and more importantly, what seems to be uh, unfolding in Lebanon, which is quite serious and quite ominous. Uh, I think we're headed towards a crossroads in the Israel-Palestine conflict uh, in Lebanon in the uh, near future, probably in the next several months. And perhaps during questions and answers, uh, we can explore what's going on there. Because in my opinion, there's a very sinister plot and I don't usually use the word plot, and there's a very sinister conspiracy, and I don't usually use the word conspiracy, but I do think there's a plot and conspiracy afoot, uh, not just by the usual suspects, the U.S. and Israel, but also France, uh, Italy, Canada, all the Western powers are now acting in concert uh, for a decisive moment. Uh, and we should be very sensitive to that fact. And just as they're laying, laying the groundwork, excuse me, just as they're laying the groundwork uh, for their evil, uh, we should now be preparing ourselves and not be left at the last moment trying to uh, mitigate a war but to prepare for it, uh, because it's going to be a decisive moment. It will either be 1967, uh, where uh, a significant defeat was delivered to the Arab world, uh, or, or it will be 1956, where the British and the French and the imperial powers of the time suffered a major setback. But it is serious, and in my opinion, it's really, if I can use the word, it's quite filthy, what's going on now. Uh, however, that's not the topic for this evening. I'll be speaking on what may seem a little bit of an academic topic. Uh, namely, I want to look at what are the foundations, what are the bases, for trying to resolve this seemingly eternal conflict. And one of the ironies, or one of the paradoxes, one of the paradoxes or ironies of the Israel-Palestine conflict is that although we're often told it's a uniquely intricate and complex conflict, and that the solutions to it are so elusive and difficult, in fact, as conflicts go in the world, it's probably the least complex, the most simple, and the most easily resolved, which is one of the things that makes studying the conflict so frustrating. Because in my opinion, if the public knew the real facts, there would be a clear path to finally finding a resolution of the conflict. So, let's look at the record. First of all, I want to begin with something that Mr. Gandhi had to say. Uh, Gandhi was, I think, extremely shrewd when it came to politics. He was a real politician in the good sense of the term. He understood politics, he understood people, he understood the people of India, um, 
And he also understood something which is of concern to us. He understood the issue of principle. So at one point, Mr. Gandhi said that all compromise is based on give and take. But there can be no give and take on fundamentals. Any compromise on fundamentals is a surrender, for it is all give and no take. The time for compromise can only come when both sides are of one mind on fundamentals. And so our job today is to figure out what are those fundamentals? What are those basic principles upon which a settlement or resolution of the conflict should be built? And what are those basic principles about which no one has the right to tell Palestinians that they have to make concessions on? Because once you start asking people to make concessions on fundamentals, as Gandhi says, then it becomes uh, all give and no take. <coughs> so what are those fundamentals on which there can be no compromise? In my opinion, and I suspect this is going to be the major point of disagreement, between myself and the second speaker, if there is disagreement, it'll be on this point. Namely, I do not see any other principles on which to figure out how to resolve the conflict than the principles of international law as it's currently understood and the principles of human rights as they're currently understood because international law and human rights are number one, they're accepted by a large part of the international community. Their legitimacy is accepted. And number two, international law and human <coughs> rights, it represents in the current world the horizon of progressive or enlightened thought. Now, some of you, I suspect, are thinking, well, human rights, international law, that doesn't sound very radical. In fact, it sounds pretty conservative. And I can understand that point of view. But we have to remember that if we're serious about politics, if we don't want to just be a cult, if we don't want to confine ourselves to a political ghetto, then we have to find a common language with the world out there. A common language, number one, and a common language which is reasonably enlightened, reasonably progressive. It is human, the language of human rights and international law the kind of language I wish we were speaking? No, because the law is quite limited. Even the human rights law is quite limited. It speaks very little to economic justice. But still, it seems to me, it offers some relief for oppressed peoples and suffering peoples. It offers some relief and it commands a broad legitimacy, which is to say we can appeal to a public on the basis of this law and say, well, this is the law. And most people will accept the legitimacy of it. Now, as it happens, as I said in my earlier remarks, there happens to be remarkable agreement on all the basic issues bearing on the Israel-Palestine conflict in the international law community and the human rights community. It is not at all a controversial issue. 
So let's try to prove that point by taking the most allegedly difficult areas. Uh, most of you are familiar with this eternal soap opera that goes by the name of the peace process. And the peace process has what's called final status issues. That is to say, issues which we're told are so complicated, so intricate, that they have to be put off to the last stages of negotiations because if you start with those issues, we're told, that the negotiations will immediately break down. They'll break down because these issues are said to be so complicated. And those complicated issues, the final status issues, is there anyone in this room who knows what they are? Uh, you should know. Let's hear. Settlements is one. Jerusalem is two. Excuse me? The right of the refugees is three. Excellent. Very good. That's the way you're supposed to teach, to elicit the answer from your students, because they'll remember it better having come from them, rather than come from the very boring professor up front. So the four final status issues are borders, settlements, East Jerusalem, and refugees. Borders, where do the borders of Israel end, and where do the borders of the state of Palestine begin? Settlements, what's the legal status of those 500,000 settlers in the settlements that Israel has constructed in the occupied Palestinian territories. East Jerusalem, to whom does it belong? And the right of the refugees, what rights do the refugees who were expelled from their homes in 1948 and 1967, what rights do they have under international law? Now as it happens by a strange coincidence, in 2004, July 2004, the highest judicial body in the world, the International Court of Justice, it was asked by the United Nations General Assembly to render an advisory opinion on the wall that Israel has been building in the occupied West Bank. And in order for the International Court in order for the court to render its opinion on the legality of the wall that Israel is building, the court had to render its opinion on three preliminary topics. Number one, they had to render an opinion on where are Israel's borders, for an obvious reason. If Israel's borders included parts of the West Bank, then the wall that Israel was building is legal. If Israel's borders did not include any of the West Bank, then it would seem to follow that Israel building a wall on its neighbor's property is illegal. Number two, the wall that Israel has been building it takes what the International Court called a sinuous, that just means a winding route, a sinuous route that goes all around the major Israeli settlements. So, the court had to decide, are the settlements legal? Because if the settlements are, Ill, are legal, then obviously you have a right to build a wall around the settlement if the settlement is legal. If the settlements are illegal, then you don't have a right to build a wall to protect the settlements and the settlers. The settlers simply have to pack up and leave if the settlements are illegal. Thirdly, they have to pass judgment on East Jerusalem because as it happens, the wall cuts right through East Jerusalem keeping the parts within Israel that are predominantly Jewish 
and keeping the parts of East Jerusalem, which are predominantly Palestinian, outside the wall. So, on three of the four critical questions, which you yourselves identified, borders, settlements, and East Jerusalem, the International Court of Justice, it rendered an opinion. Number one, on the question of borders, the court said there's a fundamental principle of international law. The technical term is a peremptory norm. For those of you who are studying the international law, it just means a tenet, a fundamental principle of the law. And the law is this, that under current international law, it's inadmissible, it's unacceptable, unacceptable that a country acquires territory by war. You can't acquire territory by war in the modern world. Well, Israel acquired the West Bank and Gaza in the course of the June 1967 war. So the court said Israel acquired the territory in the course of a war. It's inadmissible to acquire territory by war. So Israel has no title to any of the West Bank or any of Gaza. The court said the West Bank and Gaza are occupied Palestinian territory, full stop. We're not talking as the newspapers and other media frequently do. The West Bank and Gaza are not disputed territory. There is no dispute whatsoever. They are, as the highest judicial body in the world, the International Court of Justice said, those are occupied Palestinian territories. Number two, the court said that Israel acquired East Jerusalem in the same way as it acquired the West Bank and Gaza. It acquired East Jerusalem in the course of the June 1967 war. So the court said, Israel has no title to East Jerusalem. East Jerusalem is occupied Palestinian territory. And the court was very careful. It always refers in its advisory opinion to the West Bank, excuse me, to the occupied West Bank, comma, including East Jerusalem, to leave no doubt and no area for dispute that the whole of the West Bank, the whole of Gaza, as well as the whole of East Jerusalem are occupied Palestinian territories. Number three, the court looked at the question of the settlements. There are now approximately 500,000 Jewish settlers in the occupied Palestinian territories, and Israel has confiscated approximately 42% of the West Bank for these settlements. The court said that under Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, it's illegal to transfer the population from an occupying country to the occupied country. You're not allowed to transfer your population if you're occupying somebody else's country because you're not allowed to change the demographic balance inside the occupied territory. So the court said that all the Israeli settlements, all the Israeli settlements are illegal under international law. Just as the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem, whatever your media might say, are not disputed territories. And just like as many times as Israel would like to say, that East Jerusalem is part of its eternal and undivided capital. As many times as it may repeat that, the law is very clear. Just as the law is clear that the settlements belong, uh, or Israel has no right be, to be settling the occupied Palestinian territories. Finally, it's interesting to look at the vote 
in the International Court of Justice. There are 15 judges on the International Court. All 15 judges, every single one, with no dissents, every single judge agreed on those basic principles. There was some dissension on other issues, but on those issues, the, the highest uh, judicial body in the world, they had no disagreement on those questions. On the question of the legality of the wall, there was one dissent that was the American judge, Thomas Bergenthal. But even the American judge, Thomas Bergenthal, on the crucial question, because ultimately the crucial question is the settlements and their future, this is what Mr. Bergenthal has to say. He said, paragraph 6 of Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention does not admit for exceptions. It provides that the occupying power shall not deport or transfer parts of its own civilian population in the territory it occupies. And then Mr. Bergenthal says, I agree that this provision applies to the Israeli settlements in the West Bank and that their existence violates Article 49 of the Geneva Convention. So on the most fundamental question, the question of the settlements, Thomas Bergenthal, the only dissenter on the question of the legality of the wall, even he agreed. There is no dispute, no controversy whatsoever on those three issues. Well, then there's the question of the right of return. As it happens, the right of the return did not come up in the International Court of Justice opinion because it wasn't relevant to the question of the wall. But all the major human rights organizations in the world, they have weighed in on the question of the legality of the right of return. Uh, in the year 2000 and 2001, when the negotiations were going on in Camp David and later in Taba, the major human rights organizations in the world, and they are which? What are the two major human rights organizations? I don't know. Okay, who knows? You didn't, you didn't do your reading. Amnesty and what's the second? Yes, the two main ones are Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. Some folks did not do their homework assignment. They were too busy watching YouTube, which is very distressing. I have to say, about 10 years ago, people used to come up to me and say, Professor Finkelstein, I've read all your books. And nowadays, the same young people come up to me and say, Professor Finkelstein, I've watched all your YouTubes. <laughs> What's even more depressing is they seem to think it's an accomplishment. <laughs> In any event, uh, Human Rights Watch, it said, and I'm quoting it, it urges Israel to recognize the right to return for those Palestinians and their descendants who fled from territory that is now within the state of Israel and who have maintained appropriate links with that territory. Amnesty International said the same thing. It called for Palestinians who fled or were expelled from Israel, the West Bank, or Gaza Strip, along with those of their descendants who have maintained genuine links with the area, to be able to exercise their right of return. So now we've exhausted all of the supposedly controversial final status issues. Borders, Jerusalem, settlements, and the right of return. If you look at the actual record, there's literally no controversy whatsoever on those issues. So far, I've looked at what you might call the most respected uh, uh, international organizations, the International Court and the human, and human Rights Organizations. Let's now look at the most representative international organization, 
and that would be what? I'm not going to let you go. What's the most representative international organization? How do my homework? <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> I'm from Brooklyn, that's tough. I couldn't get it. I think he's getting nervous now. He's going to complain to the principal that I'm abusing him. <laughs> so what's the most representative international organization? The what? Yeah, I heard it. The, yeah, the United Nations General Assembly. Now as it happens, the United Nations General Assembly, every year it votes a resolution called the Peaceful Settlement of the Palestine Question. And by coincidence, the vote this year is coming up this week. The vote is every year, the last week in November. And the UN General Assembly, as I said, composed this resolution. And the resolution consists of the basic terms for resolving the Israel-Palestine conflict. And the basic terms are the same ones as the, United, the International Court of Justice, uh, re, uh, referred to and the human rights organizations, namely the resolution says, to put it simply, there has to be a two-state settlement on the June 1967 border, and there has to be a just resolution of the refugee question. Those are the terms. A two-state settlement on the June 67 border, and a just resolution of the refugee question. And every year the vote is the same. The vote is, quite literally, not using hyperbole, which is just a fancy word for exaggeration, but quite literally, the vote is the whole world on one side, and the United States and Israel, and some tiny islands in the South Pacific on the other side. <laughs> now that may sound like it's exaggeration, but then you'll have to judge for yourself. I'm going to run through quickly what the vote looks like going back far enough so we can see how representative it is. 1997, the vote was 155 to 2. The negative votes, United States and Israel. 1998, the vote, 154 to 2. The negative votes, the United States and Israel. 2002, the vote, 160 to 4. The negative votes, the United States, Israel, the Marshall Islands, and Micronesia. 2004, the vote, 161 to 7. The negative votes, Israel, the United States, Australia, Grenada, Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and Palau. 2007, the vote, 161 to 7. The negative votes, Israel, the US, Australia, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Nauru, and Palau. The past year, the vote, 164 to 7. The negative votes, Israel, the United States, Australia, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Nauru, and Palau. Now, some of you are wondering, what are Nauru and Palau? What are the Marshall Islands? Most of you can deduce from the name Micronesia that it's not very large. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I was reading a very complicated legal tome by a British professor named James Crawford uh, called The Creation of States Under International Law. And towards the beginning of this very dense book, uh, he has charts the smallest countries in the world in terms of population and the smallest countries in the world in terms of land size and Micronesia and Marshall Islands, Nauru and Palau they always make it on those two lists uh, to speak kindly of them not to be dismissive of, of small countries because we live in a politically correct world we can say that the combined populations of Nauru, Palau, Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands can fit comfortably in the aisles of this room and there would still be room left over. Okay, how about the regional organizations? How about, for example, the Arab League? Where do they stand in resolving the conflict? Well, in March 2002, the Arab League 
it put forth what it called the Saudi Peace Plan. And the Saudi Peace Plan called for a two-state settlement in the June 1967 border, a just resolution of the refugee question, and it said if Israel will agree to this, if Israel will agree to the terms of international law for resolving the conflict, the Arab League said, we'll not just recognize Israel, but we'll normalize relations with Israel, which is to say trade, tourism, and so forth. What was the vote in the Arab League? The vote was 22 to 0. It was unanimous. And the Arab League has kept reaffirming its commitment to this peace plan most recently at the Arab League summit in Doha in 2009. What about those crazy Muslims, those fanatics, those crazed Muslim states? Well, those crazed Muslim states, they have their organization. It's called the Organization of the Islamic Conference. It's 57 countries, all the Muslim states in the world are represented including Iran. So what position did they take? After the Arab League came out with its endorsement of international law, endorsement of the United Nations General Assembly, the organization of the Islamic Conference, it says that it adopted the Arab Peace Initiative to resolve the issue of Palestine in the Middle East and decided to use all possible means in order to explain and clarify the full implications of this initiative and to win international support for its implementation. That's the position of the Muslim states, the Islamic states in the world, entirely consistent down to the last comma and period, entirely consistent with international law, entirely consistent with the position of the highest judicial bodies in the world, the human rights organizations, and I would want to stress, so there's no misapprehension on this point, that includes Iran. If you look at the, rel the voting record on the Islamic Republic of Iran in the United Nations since 2003, when I was saying the whole world on one side, Israel, the United States, and those tiny islands on the other, that whole world includes Iran. 2003, 2004, 2005, 6, 7, 8, 9, Iran has voted with the majority on resolving the conflict. And that just leaves us Hamas, because there's no dispute uh, among any of the parties to the conflict that the Palestinian Authority, the so-called Palestinian Authority, has not only accepted these terms for resolving the conflict, but has expressed the willingness to make significant concessions. Uh, Hamas's position has been reasonably clear in recent years. A U.S. government study, a study commissioned by the United States government, it concluded, and now I'm quoting it, that Hamas has been carefully and consciously adjusting its political program for years and has sent repeated signals that it is ready to begin a process of coexisting with Israel. The head of Hamas, it's, uh, the head of Hamas is Politburo Khaled Nishal. He said in 2008 that, quote, most Palestinian forces, including Hamas, accept a state on the 1967 borders. Even right after the Israeli invasion, the Israeli massacre in Gaza in 2008-2009, Khaled Michel said again, right after, he said the objective of Hamas remains the same, the creation of a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital, the return of the Israelis to the pre-June 67 borders, and the right of return of our refugees. It's sometimes said or often said, what about Hamas's charter, the charter which is quite ugly in many aspects, I would say, but the fact of the matter is that since the mid-1990s, Hamas has rarely, if at all, referred to its charter. The only ones who refer to Israel's, excuse me, Hamas's charter are Israel and its supporters. Well, there's a lot more to say, but we're going to leave it off for questions and answers because that was the promise that this night would allow you to participate in an active way 
And so I'll just conclude on what seems to me the rational, uh, the rational inference from looking at the record. And if you look at the documentary record, the only reasonable conclusion is that the only obstacle to resolving the Israel-Palestine conflict is not the Palestinians' rejectionism, not the rejectionism of the Arab world, not the rejectionism of the Islamic world. The only obstacle to resolving the conflict is Israel's refusal to recognize the Palestinians' right to self-determination within their, within their internationally recognized borders and Israel's refusal to allow for a just resolution of the refugee question based on the right of return and compensation. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start as Muslims do in the name of God. In alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah amma ba'd. Brothers and sisters and friends, I greet you with the warmest Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. Before I formally start, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me today. It's not a topic that I usually speak upon. Um, and also, I'd like to thank Professor Fulkenstein for his presentation. And I would like to also humble myself amongst scholarly teachers of Islam in the audience too. And essentially, what I want to do is actually express myself as a human being. And how do we do that? How do we express ourselves as a human being? Well, one of the most interesting things about the philosophy of the self or the psychology of the human being is that self-knowledge is foundational. Because from knowing yourself, you know other people. And from knowing yourself, you can be sincere with what you really believe in. And I think from this perspective, it's very important for me to try and connect with the audience. Because some of the things I'm going to say, you may not agree with. But I think this presentation is important because it's rarely discussed in political discourse. And it's something that is very important for us to discuss. Now, in addressing this topic, what would bring peace to the Middle East? I found a very interesting quote from the Jewish philosopher Baruch Spinoza in his Theologica Political Treatise. And he said, peace is not an absence of war. It is a virtue, a state of mind, a disposition of benevolence, confidence and justice. And the more contemporary, Martin Luther King, he said true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. And we've said this many times on our marches, on our emails, in the forums, discussing amongst one another that there is no peace if we do not have justice. Not only is this intuitive, we know this, it's an inbuilt, innate concept, but rather we understand this from historical realities. Some people say, no, you need democracy, but I would disagree with that. If you do a brief sociological survey in Russia, it's a pseudo-dictatorship still, in a sense, if we go into that political analysis, that's another topic. But people are happy, they don't really care if it's a democracy or not, as long as they have certain elements that require the human being to progress effectively. So, since there is no peace, if there is no justice, then let's have a quick look to understand why there hasn't been peace in the Middle East for some while. And I would personally argue that it's because of the injustices of the Zionist entity. Let's go back in history. The infamous or famous or well-known historical figure from a Zionist perspective is Ben-Gurion. And what did he say on January the 1st, 1948, in his own personal diary? He said, there is a need now for strong and brutal reaction. We need to harm them without mercy, women and children included. Otherwise, this is not effective reaction. There is no need to distinguish between guilty and not guilty. Also, if we look at what's happened with regards to the atrocities by the IDF, they murdered hundreds of Egyptian prisoners of war in both the 1956 and 67 wars. In 1967, the Zionist entity 
expelled between 100,000 and 260,000 Palestinians from the newly conquered West Bank and drove approximately 100,000 Syrians from the Golan Heights. According to Amnesty International, Israel has destroyed more than 10,000 homes between 1967 and 2003. Israel, the Zionist entity, was complicit in the Sabra and Shatila massacre of 3,000 innocent lives. And an Israeli investigation said that the minister, the defense minister at the time, Ariel Sharon, was to bear personal responsibility. Also, during the relatively recent Lebanese war, the idea fired over one million bomblets in a population of 650,000. That's one and a half bombs per person in southern Lebanon. And one Israeli soldier said, what we did was insane and monstrous. Human Rights Watch concluded, Israel has violated one of the most fundamental tenets of the law of war, the duty to carry out attacks on military targets. And it's no wonder that Professor of Political Science John Mersheimer and Professor of International Affairs Stephen Walt, they state, viewed objectively, Israel's past and present conduct offers little moral basis for privileging it over the Palestinians. And the list goes on. Any Google search or search with regards to Amnesty International, the UN resolutions, violations, and any other entity as such, you would see the atrocities and injustices committed by the Zionist regime. So if there is no peace without justice, what would bring justice to the Middle East? Now, let's talk about what the current solutions have proposed. First and foremost, I believe from my humble perspective, and it's a political analysis that many key contemporary political analysts share, is that America does, frankly, not give a damn about anything. The reason for that, because America's foreign policy goals, especially in the 21st century, is just to create havoc and chaos. Under the guise of humanity, or liberalism, or democracy. And the reason for that, because it doesn't want another hegemony to rise, especially in the Arab world. It just makes sense. This is a profound political analysis, very simple. But if you see the types of actions that the, America, the American political stakeholders have put forth with regards to puppeting the world, you would see and you would conclude that they just want to create havoc and chaos under the pretense of peace and justice and all these kind of uh, terms in order to prevent another hegemony from rising either in the Middle East or elsewhere. What about democracy? How, is that going to work? Well, I mean, the Palestinians participate in a democratic process and voted in Hamas. And America and Israel failed to recognize it. And a, a very interesting article in the Foreign Policy magazine, it said that the American administration wants democracy, but up to a certain point. And it has to be couched in the right type of ideological rhetoric or the ideological environment. If it's something that's too away from the goals and policies or the ideology of the American regime, then it's not democracy anymore, even though they probably followed the democratic process. What about the two-state solution? Well, I don't think the two-state solution is going to work personally because the problem with the two-state solution, if you see some, some of the reports that were discussed, is that it will be a state within a state. Because if you read some of the reports, it was mentioning things like the Palestinian state would have a restricted army. They may not control their own airspace, etc., etc. So this to me seems to be a state within a state. So the question is, what is left? Well, what is extremely humorous is that if we go to America and we see the neocons, some of the neocons advocating some, this type of Zionist agenda. Now, the philosophy of neoconservatism is quite interesting, which is based upon conservatism. What does conservatism actually say? It basically says, don't reinvent the wheel. What worked in history will work now with a few minor adjust adjustments for the 21st century. So this is the philosophy of the conservatives, essentially. To conserve, to preserve what was working before. Don't be too radical. 
Even if we follow that type of philosophy, I think what I'm going to mention now is maybe an indication of what would work in the future. So let's look at history and find out when was it and what kind of political environment, what kind of environment with regards to values and principles. Professor Finkelstein talked about principles and we should talk about principles, the principles of justice. So what kind of principles and how do they manifest themselves in this type of environment in order for Jews, whether they're religious or atheist, in order for Muslims, in order for any other persons to live harmoniously under the same type of political framework. So I'm going to list some kind of interesting history that we don't really read about in our books because it's not published, it's not popular intellectual literature. Bahia ibn Pakuda was a medieval Andalusian Jewish writer. He describes the prosperous existence of the Jews and he says in his treatise Kitab al-Hidayah, if one of our contemporaries looks for similar miracles now, let him examine objectively our situation among the Gentiles, i.e. the Muslims. Since the beginning of the diaspora and the way our affairs are managed in spite of the differences between us and them both, secret and open, which are well known to them, let him see that our situation as far as living and subsistence are concerned is the same as theirs or even better. Benjamin of Toledo, a Spanish Jew who traveled to Baghdad in the year 1168 CE, described the situation of Iraqi Jewry in these words. In Baghdad, there are about 40,000 Jews and they dwell in security, prosperity and honor under the great Caliph. In 1420 CE, a rabbi, Yitzhak Tsarfati, wrote a letter to his persecuted German brothers from the Ottoman Turkish territory and he says, your cries and laments have reached us. We have been told of all the sorrows and persecution, persecutions which you suffer. Listen, my brothers, if you knew even the tenth of what God has blessed us in this land, you would give heed to no further difficulties. Another rabbi, an Italian rabbi, Obedia Yara de Betunoro, he traveled to Jerusalem in 1486 CE and he wrote a letter to his father and he was saying, the Jews are not persecuted by the Arabs in these parts. I have traveled through the country in its length and breadth and none of them has put an obstacle in my way. They are very kind to strangers, particularly to anyone who does not know the language. And if they see many Jews together, they are not annoyed by it. Another Jewish historian, Elijah Kapsali, describes the Jewish prosperity in the Ottoman period. He says the Jews gathered together from all the cities of Turkey, both far and near, each person coming from his own place. The heavens helped them too and the king provided them with perfect estates and houses filled with all kinds of goodness. A Portuguese Jewish chronicler, Samuel Usk, he elaborates on the Jewish migrant situation of the city of Salonika, which is now in Greece, but it was under Ottoman rule. And he says, the majority of my children who have been persecuted and exiled from Europe and many other parts of the world have taken refuge in this city. And she embraces them and receives them with much love and goodwill if she were Jerusalem. Another Italian Jewish traveler, David de Rossi, in the 16th century, he said, the exile here is not like in our homeland. The Turks hold Jews in esteem. Here in Alexandria, Jews are the chief officers and administrators of the customs. And finally, from a historical perspective, you have Heinrich Graetz, a 19th century Jewish historian. He expressed how under this type of governance, the Jews were favored. For example, he says, it was in these favorable circumstances the ja Spanish Jews came under the rule of the Mohammedans, in other words, the Muslims. And this is supported by contemporary historians like Karen Armstrong, she's a popular historian who says the Muslims had established a system that enabled Jews, Christians and Muslims to live in Jerusalem together for the first time. And Professor Dean Philip Bell, who is a Dean and Professor of Jewish History at Spertus Institute of Jewish Studies in Chicago, he makes a very interesting point. He says Jews under medieval Islam never suffered from the same general negative perception as in the Christian West. 
Despite regional variations and high medieval political instability, in medieval Islam, multicultural environments combined with engagement in sciences and literature led to something of an Islamic golden age for the Jews. It is no wonder Zayn Zohar, who is a modern Jewish historian, he talks how the Jews welcomed the Muslims and he said, Thus when the Muslims crossed the Straits of Gibraltar and the Iberian Peninsula, the Jews saw the Muslims as liberators from Christian persecution. Now, the question here is, is this a historical accident? I would argue it's not. I would argue this all happened because there was an objective grounding for ethics and morality, political ethics and morality at that time. Something which is very absent in the Muslim world. Even the so-called organizations that seem to represent the Islamic world, they're not very representative at all. Because if you go to the average Joe in the Muslim world and say, do you think Mubarak actually represents you? Then they will probably spit on the floor three times on the left shoulder. Yeah? Which you do in the Islamic tradition, you think you've been insinuated by the devil or something. Yeah? So the point here is that they're not rep representative at all. And I think because the Muslims, not only do they say that the, a lot of the dictators and despots in the Muslim world don't actually represent them, but it's not because there's no democratic process, but it's because they do not adopt their heritage. And it's simple as that. So I would argue what I've just mentioned is not a historical accident because the literature of Islam, for example, the Quran is actually the book of the Muslims. It says, you know, God does not forbid you to, do, to deal justly and kindly with those who fought not against you on account of religion, nor drove you out of your homes. Indeed, God loves the just. I know this sounds like religious rhetoric, but you have to see it from principles as a principle of justice, grounded in objective grounding. Because if you think about it, and this is going to be quite a brave statement, secular ethics and law, they don't have an objective grounding. They could be voted down by National Assembly or changed by crazy Zionists. Because that's the reality, it's based on fellow feeling. It's based on what the majority say. And this philosophically has huge problems. Not only does it render political ethics and morality subjective, but it provides the way for a very interesting future if the dynamics of social influence change. And in this light, the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad وسلم, peace and blessings be upon him, he said, anyone who kills a non-Muslim will not smell the fragrance of paradise. So there's an emotional driving force here to prevent the Muslims, if they're in authority, from harming a non-Muslim. Significantly, he said, whoever harms a non-Muslim harms me. Now you saw the fury, what happened in the Danish cartoons. A hundred people died, embassies were burnt, just because someone degraded the name of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, imagine if Muslims actually had stuck to the heritage and used this principle of justice and listening to wisdom. It would be, we would be going crazy if any non-Muslims die. Do you see? And this is a, a good value. This is a good value to hold. And this is why we are bound to the treaties of the Prophet Muhammad as Muslims. Uh, and if you look at the Treaty of Medina, the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, it is incumbent on all the Muslims to help and extend sympathetic treatment to the Jews who have entered an agreement with us. Neither any oppression of any type should be perpetrated on them, nor the enemy be helped against them. So, you may be wondering this question, why have I even mentioned Islam here? Well, the importance with this is that if we don't take into consideration the heritage of the people living in that environment and the majority of the people that are Muslim, if we don't take into consideration their heritage, they voted Hamas, many people say it wasn't an Islamic question, it was to do with accountability and it was to do with corruption, which I agree. But we don't, we, we're viewing it from secular lenses. It was also done because there's an objective moral grounding here, there's more trust because of the objective moral grounding and with regards to political ethics that Hamas actually tried to represent. So the point I'm trying to make here, we need to talk about Islam here because it actually forms a part of people's daily lives and their world view. It's their glasses how they see the world. So we can talk about international, which, which is interesting. We can talk about human rights, but even that topic itself, I think is a bit abstract. The reason I'm saying this is because if you read the works of Professor Jean Chavez in his book, um, The Liberal Project and Human Rights, 
he actually says, look, the human rights regime, the UN regime of human rights, is actually a liberalized version of human rights. This is why you got the Arab world saying, no, let's make our own human rights. Because if you think about it, the underlying premise for human rights, according to the UN, is essentially an individualistic premise, an atomistic, what they call in political philosophy. Whereas from an Islamic perspective, and I'm not here to talk for the whole, all the Muslims, I'm just saying from my humble perspective, we don't have a liberal view on human rights. We don't think the individual is sovereign from that perspective. We believe in our political philosophy that there is a relationship between the individual and society and society and the individual. So our conception of human rights, we don't disagree with human rights, we agree with it. Even in our Islamic literature, we call it hukuk alibad, the rights of man, the rights of people. But the point is, our conception is totally different. This is the discussion we should be having. So, essentially, I'd like to end uh, by saying that Islam should be mentioned as Islam's basis for political values, ethics and morality, in my opinion, from a philosophical perspective, is grounded on a sense of, of objectivity. Unlike, in my humble opinion, which we could discuss much later, the relative and subjective grounding of secular, the secular framework. So, in essence, it could never be voted down by the masses just because we decided for it to be wrong, and it can never be changed by crazy science. Um, now, the final point I'd like to add is this. Why is a Greek guy that looks Pakistani here, yeah? <laughs> why is a Greek guy that looks Pakistani talking about an Arab problem? But well, this is the crux of the matter. You see, the reason many Muslims in this audience are actually worried about the situation is for two reasons. One, humanity, okay? Humanity. We're human beings, okay? And as human beings, we want to fight against injustice. That is not only an innate struggle, but it's something that we all share. But the second point, which I think is an added enhancement, is because from a religious perspective, what you have to understand is this. I don't know a single Palestinian in Palestine. I've never been to Palestine. But the reason I might give my life for Palestine is because I consider these people my brothers and sisters and my mother and my father. And this is something that a lot of Western commentators do not understand. Why are you guys so crazy? Why are you guys so... Because so what? He's an Iraqi. He's a Palestinian. We don't have this concept in the Islamic tradition. We don't believe in national borders or boundaries. What links us are two things. We're human beings. Okay? We're human beings, so that links us. That's our tradition. And the, I would argue the, the value enhancement is that if you have the same world view, i.e. you believe in Allah, you believe in God, and you believe in the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa then there's an extra bond here, which we say is a bond that transcends blood. If we understand this, if the non-Muslims in the audience understand this, they would really understand that, you know what? For every single Muslim, when he sees someone dying and he's a Muslim, he's never met him, it's as if his own mother has died. You may think this is bizarre and abstract and crazy, but the best way forward is to sit in each other's shoes, which creates empathy and understanding. And this is why I want to bring up such a controversial topic and talk about Islam, because why not? It's the heritage of the people there. Why don't we bring it to the table of political discourse and have a frank, open discussion? Maybe I'm wrong, but let's find out. Thank you very much for listening. The question was, if in fact, If, in fact, what I stated in my initial remarks was true, then how do you account for the fact that Israel still gets to go its merry way? And I'm going to use that question as an opportunity to try to respond, but briefly, to uh, Hamza's remarks uh, a moment ago. I think we enter a problematic territory when, on the one hand, we want to invoke international law. So Hamza quotes Amnesty International 
when Amnesty International criticizes or censures Israel, and he quotes a large number of other authorities when they criticize or censure Israel. Uh, he invokes international law, but then says that, well, there really isn't international law, or Muslims have a different conception of human rights. Yes, Muslims believe in human rights, but we have our own conception of human rights. You can't have it both ways. You can't pick and choose when it comes to the law. You want to walk at the green light, but when it comes to the red light and you pass through, you tell the officer, but wait, Muslims have a different conception of the red light. In our view, you can pass through a red light. Well, obviously, if you're going to go at the green, you have to stop at the red. You can't pick and choose when it comes to the law. If you want to condemn Israel's violations of human rights, as Amnesty less frequently, but still often, Human Rights Watch does, then you have to take the whole thing or reject the whole thing. The international law, as I tried to say, is very clear on these issues. There is no controversy and there's no dispute. And that includes in the question of Israel. Israel has no title to the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, but Israel as a state is a member state of the United Nations, and it has the same rights and the same responsibilities as any other state. <laughs> now, some of you may not like that, but that's the law. And if you want to reject the whole law, then you have to accept the consequences of objecting, the whole, objecting or rejecting the whole of the law. And the consequences, to my thinking, are very clear. The choice is, yes, there are Muslims and Arabs in the UK, in places like Manchester, I understand, there are now fully 25% of the population. But 25%, even in Manchester, is still a minority. And there is no way we can win this cause unless we figure out a way to break through to the mainstream, to the public, to the people outside this room. Do you want a feel-good? The feel-good of saying things which you like to hear, but have no resonance and no meaning to the world out there? Or do you want to break out of the cult, break out of the ghetto, and reach into the mainstream? That's the choice. And the choice is not, frankly, in my opinion, about you or me. Because the whole reason we should be here is because people are suffering. And we want to lift the burden, or at least try to lessen the burden of the suffering. And in my opinion, the only way we can achieve that is trying to reach a public opinion and getting them to act on what they think is wrong. One of the ironies, one of the paradoxes of this whole discussion is when I listen to Hamza speak with all due respect, he sounds exactly like the Israelis. <laughs> because, no, allow me to explain why. Because it's the Israelis 
who don't want to hear from international law. It's the Israelis who keep condemning the international court's advisory opinion. It's the Israelis who keep attacking Amnesty International. It's the Israelis who keep attacking the human rights organizations. It's the Israelis who say, you don't understand the Arabs and Muslims. They have a different conception of human rights than the ones in the West. When you torture Muslims and Arabs, it's not the same thing as torturing a Brit or a French person, because they have a different conception of human rights. So when you reject that law, when you reject those human rights, you're doing exactly what the Israelis want. The whole point of my introductory remarks was to show that quite remarkably, on all the crucial questions bearing on the Israel-Palestine conflict, to put it crudely, but I think accurately, on all the crucial questions, Israel is on the wrong side of the law. The law says the settlements are illegal. The law says East Jerusalem belongs to the Palestinians. The law says that the Palestinians have a right of return. So I have to ask myself now, speaking as a non-believer, why in God's name would you want to reject the law? It doesn't make any sense. That is... That is our strongest card. Right now, it happens to be our most powerful weapon is the law. And I find it deeply troubling, not to say dispiriting and distressing, that our most powerful weapon, the weapon that Israel is desperately trying to neutralize, that powerful weapon that we have, is now being neutralized by our side. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, respected sir, um, you mentioned that the solution is in human rights and international law. Uh, what would you say to the uh, following contention? Uh, international law operates horizontally and is dependent on state cooperation, uh, as opposed to vertical operation of domestic legislation. Uh, as a result, we have issues of enforcement. In some cases, it's less effective, and other cases, completely ineffective. Uh, further, any action or sanction must come through the United Nations Security Council resolutions or authorization. Uh, and we know we have the US and the UK as the permanent members. Um, so any action through here is, 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 is mediocre, if any. Uh, UN seems incapable in, uh, in enforcing or acting upon uh, certain violations which even amount to just cogent norms. Um, what compounds this is the fact that even if there is some action of enforcement, uh, Israel seems to repeatedly remain defiant uh, and itself, uh, and, and, and it refuses to subordinate itself to any external organizations or really does so. So the question is, with the uh, aforementioned in mind, how do you actually practically <coughs> implement a solution based upon human rights and international law? Uh, and secondly, which links to this is, do you believe an armed human, uh, humanitarian intervention is a viable, a viable option? That happens to be an excellent question. It was put at some length, but every, no, every aspect, every aspect of his question was very important. That was a serious question. The essence of it, as I understand him, is unlike in domestic law, what's called technically municipal law, where you have a police who enforces the law, when it comes to international law, Enforcement is much more difficult unless you have the great powers behind the enforcement of the law. So they'll enforce the law when uh, to, evict, to evict Iraq from Kuwait, but they won't enforce the law to evict the Israelis from the occupied Palestinian territories. And so the question is, well then, what do you do when the law sounds okay, not terrific, but okay, 
but its enforcement is very weak, feeble, and sometimes non-existent. And there, to me, the answer is fairly clear, though it's not an easy answer. Because the answer is, to put it in the briefest of ways, the answer is us. We have to mobilize in order to enforce or bring enough force to bear so that the law is enforced. Now what does that mean concretely? Let's take a simple example. Beginning in June 2007, Israel imposed a merciless, heartless blockade of Gaza. In fact, the blockade had been going on for a long time, from 1991, the closure, but by June 2007, they had tightened the screws and the blockade was merciless. Amnesty International called it a flagrant violation of international law. Later on, the Goldstone mission said it was a possible crime against humanity, that blockade. The former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights from Ireland, Mary Robinson, she journeyed to Gaza during that period and she said that the whole civilization is being destroyed in Gaza. A whole civilization. It was completely illegal. A flagrant violation of international law. Collective punishment against the civilian population. In this case, the civilian population was being punished because it participated in a democratic election and elected into power a party that the US and Israel didn't approve of. And for three years, the entire world was silent. Not a word, not a peep from the international community. And then a flotilla of boats went to Gaza, the Freedom Flotilla, and about nine passengers, not about, nine passengers on the flagship, the Mavi Marmara, were killed by Israeli commandos. Six of them were killed in what the UN report called, the good UN report called, summary execution, which is to say they were just murdered in cold blood. And then what happened the next day? The next day, all of a sudden, all the world leaders, singly and together, they all started to say, the blockade of Gaza is unsustainable. In fact, they all use the same word. They're not very intelligent. <laughs> They're, the blockade of Gaza is unsustainable. It has to be lifted. The blockade of Gaza is unsustainable, said the Security Council. It has to be lifted. So said Hillary Clinton. So said your foreign minister. They all said it. Now, truth be told, nine months, excuse me, six months later, uh, the director of operation for UNRWA, the main UN relief organization in Gaza, he says there's been no tangible improvement. And I'll acknowledge that. And that means to even extract the most meager, the most tiny of concessions from the powers that be, it's very tough. I'm not going to dispute that. It is hard. But the example of the Mavi Marmara, to me, not to try to put it in a category all its own, but that example is the right one. Because the basic principle of politics Again, speaking as a non-believer, the simple and most fundamental truth of politics is God helps those who help themselves. We have to act. But you have to remember, there would have been no reaction to what happened on the Mavi Marmara if the flotilla were asking for something that was illegal. Their whole appeal was based on the fact that the blockade is illegal under international law. 
And then they tried through mass action to try to impose the law or force the powers that be. They accomplished something significant in my opinion, but did they achieve everything? No, because it's a long, it's a hard struggle. The people in power, you know, there is a famous African-American abolitionist. Uh, his name was Frederick Douglass. Some of you may know his name. And he once said, power never concedes anything without a demand. It never has, it never will. You have to fight. It's tooth and nail to extract anything from them. But I don't see any other way if we want to achieve our goals. We have to appeal to a large community based on understood, accepted, if limited, principles of right and wrong. Uh, although I have been misconstrued slightly, <laughs> apart from being an Israeli. Um, <laughs> maybe it's like, you know, I'm, in the sh I'm an undercover Mossad agent or something, you know, <laughs> trying to put a span in the works. All I've tried to do, just to clarify, because I, I never assumed this was going to be some kind of debate. I, you know, I think we're relatively on the same side uh, from a political perspective anyway. Like, you know, we think what's happening in Israel is an injustice. However, I think it will be of a type of secular arrogance not to consider the points I took into consideration today. The reason being, we cannot solve a problem by assuming by assuming that everyone has the philosophical world view. That's not how things are going to work. And frankly, things haven't worked. Um, so from, from that perspective, all I was humbly saying is, look, take this framework, which is universal in principle, justice, okay, dealing with people's problems, take that onto the table and let's have a frank discussion about a unique heritage of a particular people that are involved in this conflict. If we don't put that in the equation, all we do is we secularize a people that do not want to be secular. And if you look at the polls, the Maryland poll and other polls and the, and the demonstrations that have been happening in Palestine, you would see that clearly. These people don't want to be secular. So what do we do? Do we just brush this under the carpet and say, no, you have to think that international law is the gospel truth and you have to have this conception of human rights, that is totally unfair. I think we need to be frank and call a spade a spade. I know the easy way out is saying yes international law, yes human rights. We've been saying that for many years, okay? Now the point is, if we want to have a more of a nuanced discussion, then let's take the particular perspectives, visions, worldviews, philosophies of that people into consideration. We do all the time when we talk about Zionism, we do all the time when we're trying to dismantle new conservatism, we go straight to the roots. But when we want to talk about the people who are involved in this conflict, oh no, we have to actually transcend their viewpoint, secularize them, and ensure that they have to agree with international law, a conception of it. By the way, I, I didn't say anything wrong about international law, all I humbly said was, you know, we have differences in human rights. How is, that's not a problem. That is not a problem. I mean, you know, the problem is when we start thinking that people's conceptions of things are problem. That's the problem. And I think that's being Israeli. <laughs> and from that perspective. So, you know, so all, and all, so all I humbly want to do is just bring something that hasn't been spoken about, it hasn't been spoken about, and it should be spoken about, whether you consider it a minority opinion or not, the point is, it's worked in history, why don't we try it? You know, we, we've glossed nearly all options, and what I'm understood from Professor Finkelstein is that in order for international to have any credence, or for any value, is that we have to rise up and actually almost have a physical struggle, yeah? I mean, what does that say about international law? It doesn't say much. It doesn't say, to me, it doesn't say much, frankly. We had an illegal Iraq war that was illegal, but because you have power, you could transcend it. And this is the problem that people have. How can we trust this? I personally don't trust it. Now, if we do want solutions, then maybe we need to just expand the discussion. That's all I'm humbly saying. I'm not saying this is the only way, this is the right way. I'm just telling, I'm just trying to, because sometimes what happens is this, right? When you engage with another community that have similar values but some of the values are different many times the human psychological perspective that they would always talk about commonalities I think that's problematic 
because it's from the differences they're the things that cause the fears and anxieties if you don't discuss the differences then you're never gonna humanize and make relevant uh, the other people you're always going to try to link on commonalities whereas the differences are the thing that causes the fear if you don't want fear anymore if you don't want anxiety anymore then let's talk about the fundamental philosophical differences that people have I think that's a good thing that, that's, that's how we got the enlightenment it's because we had these issues and with these discussions amongst you know the post enlightenment pre enlightenment philosophers I don't see that's a problem now to come and say frankly that you know we can't have a cake and eat it well we can because you know when you get the green light there's always that orange as well yeah? <laughs> but, but in fairness, sorry, in fairness, you know, this shouldn't be a debate. I just wanted to humbly bring it to the discussion table to, think, to see what people think, to see what the professor thinks. You know, uh, um, I admire his work and, and the things that he's doing, which, you know, I think, you know, more people should do that. And, and, and so I'm not coming across from a point of trying to be antagonistic. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Uh, this question is for Hamza again. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm still not clear on exactly what your point is. Uh, taking into account all the assumptions you made of what doesn't work as a solution for Israel and Palestine and putting aside your quotations that you made, it's still not clear what you're suggesting. I don't see how Islam could add could shed any light into the problem. Um, it seems like you're suggesting Said Edwards, Edward Said's notion of um, Orientalism, maybe, that we should take that into account. But based on your quotations, it sounds like you're suggesting that we should go back into history and have an Israeli state where Muslims are in charge of the Jews because it worked back then in history because a couple of rabbis suggested that they were happy during that time of history. So I'm not really clear. So if you could clarify, I know you tried clarifying, but it doesn't really make any sense what you're suggesting. You're appealing to justice and Nobody really knows what justice means. I, I mean, I study philosophy and I can't tell you what justice means. So if you could, I don't know if you can clarify, that'd be great. <laughs> I, I'll be very brief because I do appreciate that there's many more pertinent questions from a political academic sense that has to be answered by Professor Finkelstein. So I'll be very brief. That's a very good question. See. This question actually allows you now to enter my emotional intellectual space as a Muslim, which is great, yeah? And this is what we need to do, this is how we connect as human beings. Now, see, philosophically, we believe, and I don't want to get into some kind of religious philosophical discussion, but we believe our notions of justice come from a certain framework, okay? Because we believe this framework to be divine. That's another topic, another philosophical discussion, but take that assumption from the Muslim perspective. So if it is divine, then there's some rational logic that Muslims follow. One, the divine is more knowing or wise. Two, human beings in contrast are not. Three, therefore we just submit to the divine. Yeah? It's simple as that. So, wait, wait, wait. So my point is, so my, my point is, my point is, this is, this is why I mean, look, you know when people laugh, right? It's because we live in an age of post-secularism, which, you know, religion is laughed upon and it has no philosophical strong arguments. But I think this is the arrogant, in my, in my fair opinion, yeah? Um, so, what, what we need to do is understand the Muslim mindset. Yeah, understand a human being with, with a different view. So that's the logical rationale behind why we do things. So, if that framework says this is justice, we will agree with it ontologically from a foundational perspective, yeah? So if justice is not harming your neighbor, if justice is, as the Quran says, do not let the hate of others make you swerve from doing right. Do right, be just, even if it's against yourself, rich or poor. So these are values that we take, which you can claim are universal, they are universal, but the difference is what the Muslim will claim, or even a believer will claim, is that these values now become grounded objectively because in absence of God if you read the works of Kant and other works you would see that these values in absence of an ontological grounding are what? they become subjected and ephemeral because Professor Finkelstein actually mentioned it himself it's that fellow feeling consensus but there's a problem here and I would argue to follow and this is a very blatant statement to follow just consensus and what people come together to agree upon 
What's the difference in 1940s Germany when there was a consensus that they could kill six million Jews? We disagree with this as human beings, we disagree with this as Muslims, and the reason I disagree with it philosophically is because I don't think consensus should, should give us what our ethics and laws are. So, to be frank, if you're a non-believer, you can never claim objective moral values. Just like professor, the late professor atheist L.J. Mackey, what he said was, Everything is relative because there's no ontological foundation. And this is, this is how you understand us, and it's as simple as that. Thank you. First of all, thank you for an excellent lecture. Uh, I would like to offer maybe, uh, to put it in different words for Hamza, um, maybe instead of looking at the international law as some lofty idea, maybe we can look at it as the bare minimum, as the foundation to which we should lay upon uh, our arguments and then you can talk about any lofty idea other than that. Uh, now I will try to make my question short. Uh, talking about the foundations uh, for resolution of the conflict, uh, Gandhian foundations, could it be that we left out one foundation which is the inherent ethnic nature of the Israeli state from its very beginning? And actually the question of equality or democracy inside Israel is probably the, uh, the thing that Israel is most fearful about, even more than the return of the refugees or any other issue. I mean, pol Israeli politicians as well as Israeli public treat the 20% uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel as the demographic bomb, uh, the enemy from within, a fifth column, and so on. Uh, and this is about Israel proper. Two days ago, uh, a Bedouin village in the Nakeb, in the Negev, uh, has been demolished for the seventh time just because they are non-Jews, and so on. Uh, if you could address this, please. Well, there is no question that the foundational ideology of the state of Israel uh, was, as the Israeli historian, who used to be pretty decent, now he's regrettably lost his mind, uh, Benny Morris. Uh, he said in one of his books, the one published by Cambridge University Press, it was entitled The uh, Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Question Revisited. It's a very large book. And he says in the book that the idea of transfer, transfer was just the euphemism that was used back then for what we call now ethnic cleansing, uh, Benny Morris said the idea of transfer was inbuilt and inevitable in Zionism. Those are his exact words, it's not a paraphrase. The idea of transfer was inbuilt and inevitable in Zionism because there was no other way to create a largely or predominantly Jewish state in an area which was overwhelmingly not Jewish. The only way to do it was to expel the indigenous population. And there's also no question that there are aspects of that, uh, aspects of that mindset that still endure in the Israeli state, in an Israeli legislation, and that the state remains uh, in significant ways a discriminatory state uh, uh, under which the, uh, the uh, non-Jewish population, which is about 20%, uh, has second class and sometimes even worse uh, than second class status. It's also true to say that there are large numbers of international conventions uh, which don't allow for discrimination against citizens within the state. The conventions are weak in terms of enforcement, uh, but they exist. Uh, so it's not as if Israel's treatment of its non-Jewish population is accepted by international law, quite the contrary. It's rejected by international law. One thing I want to just comment on, uh, again, I, I agree we don't want to engage in a debate uh, because it becomes too personalized and it ends up pre precluding you from participating. But one thing I've found useful, uh, I take a, an interest in reading the speeches of Syed Nasrallah, the head of the Hezbollah. His speeches are generally quite long. They run between 20 and 60 pages. 
depending on the day of the week that he's giving his <laughs> speech. Uh, and the speeches have a very interesting structure, which is uh, I want to relate to uh, Hamza's comments and also to the members of the audience who find appealing what uh, Hamza has to say. Uh, I can agree, actually, with a lot of what he says. I have no problem with saying that. Uh, in fact, if you were to ask me were I to give a personal presentation of what I believed should be the solution to the conflict, then I being an old-fashioned communist with a small c, I would say the obvious solution is to eliminate all states and all borders and have one world community. That would be... That would be... That would be my personal solution. But as I think virtually everyone would agree, even those who heartily applauded my solution, you would agree that it has no it has no bearing whatsoever on the real world as it exists today. And that our job, if we're political people, our responsibility is not to convey personal opinions, but to convey political notions which have some possibility of achieving some sort of victory. And here I think that Gandhi's approach to politics was very enlightening. Gandhi always said the, the, the goal of politics is not to change people's opinions. No, he said, that's not the goal of politics. The purpose of politics is to get people to act on what they already know is wrong to get people to act on what they already know is wrong. So, take the character of Gandhi himself. Gandhi led two lives. One life, most of you are familiar with, he was a leader of the independence struggle in India. But then he had a second life. He led an ashram, or several ashrams. An ashram is kind of like a cult. For those of you who are familiar with Gandhi's history or his life, he had the life as a political leader and then the life as a cult leader. He was a kind of guru. And the life of the ashram was very strict. The obvious things, a very strict diet, no meat, a very strict personal life, you had to practice Brahmacharya, uh, Brahmacharya, you had to be celibate. And Gandhi, he had the members of his ashram, they had to keep a diary of what they do every minute of the day. Because he thought there was nothing more sinful than squandering time. Time should be used for public service. And you have to give an accounting of every minute in your diary, and then he read that diary. And when you were doing chores in the kitchen, you weren't allowed to joke or laugh. Yes, he had a rule about that. Now why do I mention all this? Because obviously, uh, Gandhi as a political leader, he didn't set those rules for membership in the Congress party. Because if he set his personal values as the political program of the Congress party, the entire Congress party of, excuse me, of 500 million Indians would fit in this room. Because there's a difference between an ashram, a cult, and there's a difference between being a guru and being a political leader. When you want to achieve independence for all of India, which includes Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, and a thousand other varieties of people, you have to find a political 
formula or program that's going to reach out to everybody or it will not succeed. And so I will not come here when I'm asked to speak to give personal formulas for how to achieve something in this political contest, a very protracted and uh, painful political contest. I am simply trying to lay out principles which I think have the possibility of reaching a large number of people. It's not my personal agenda. And I think it's extremely selfish and self-absorbed, having nothing to do with you. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. But it's, it would be extremely selfish and self-absorbed if I were to come here and take up your time with my personal agenda. That's really, it's being completely insensitive to the suffering of the people there. And that's why we should, I hope that's why we're gathered here. Because we want to lessen the suffering of the people there. And the last thing I began by mentioning the Mr. Nasrallah, because he's an interesting synthesis of both, you can say, Hamza and myself. If you read his speeches, the first quarter of his speeches always begin with references to the Quran, references to Islam, references to Islamic history. I'll be honest. I always skip that part. I scroll down just about where one quarter of the way down. And then Mr. Nasrallah, he starts with a very shrewd analysis of politics. All of a sudden, let's just say nicely, the Muslim part gets compartmentalized. And then it becomes that shrewd, political tactician's mind. It's very interesting to watch. I'll take the example of the last speech he gave. I assume it's the last one he gives him quite frequently. Uh, but the Martyr's Day speech, actually he's giving a very important speech on Sunday uh, having to do with developments, uh, but uh, recent developments. But take the Martyr's Day speech. I was very struck by it. Not only did he cite Tony Blair's memoir? But he cited already, he cited George Bush's memoir. Now, bear in mind, Bush's memoir had only been published five days before. Five days before. It was published on a Tuesday. And five days later, he was already citing it. You know, it seems he read Bush's memoir before knowing Bush. Bush read his memoir. <laughs> and that, to me, is an example worth bearing in mind. I'm not going to say the Quran, Quranic values, and so forth has no place. And I'm certainly not going to tell anybody else that it has no place. But look at his speeches. The last three quarters, and I would have anyone challenge me because I read them all. The last three quarters are very, to use Hamza's language, they're very secular. They're very, uh, uh, they're very shrewd. You always learn from his speeches. I would say, honestly, he is the only political leader in the world from whom you learn in the speeches. He's a teacher. You know? It's not like Obama with his empty platitudes. You know? I, I can't bear Obama anymore, really. I, this, this guy is driving me mad. Uh, you really learn. There is substance. And that's something which you should think about. He sits down, he reads those Israeli papers. He reads those newspapers. He reads all their books. He is on top of all of that. 
And that's what we have to be. That's what we have to be. We have to know their language, we have to know their weaknesses, we have to study them, we have to be able to answer them. Because they have this vast, vast apparatus of, let's just put it simply, of lies. This vast apparatus of lies. And it's hard work, but we have to do it to dissect and expose every lie. And the way to do that is not reading the Quran. It's doing what Mr. Nasrallah does. He reads the memoirs, he reads the newspapers, and then he brings to bear a very shrewd, one might even say, an X-ray eye. And that's the only reason why Hezbollah has been able to prevail, and Hezbollah is still with us, but that's also the reason why the powers that be are now out and are plotting, as I speak now, they're out to destroy it. They want to destroy it not because of the first quarter of his speech, because he recites the Quran, because all of those seventh century gold herders who lead Saudi Arabia, they cite the Quran also. They want to destroy him because of the last three quarters of his speech. Because he's smart, he's competent, and horror of horrors, so far, so far, you would say, God willing, so far, he's incorruptible. And so he has to be destroyed. And that's, I think for us, a good example. Keep your values, I'm not preaching to anyone. But bear in mind, there is no way to defeat them unless you master their language, master the facts, and are able to answer.